So here I would like to demonstrate how to compute the electronic contribution to entropy from simple metals. So this is, is very similar to uh, configurational entropy. In configurational entropy, you have you know, your lattice and you're occupying that lattice with, you know, for example, red or blue atoms. And you're counting the number of configurations. In the case of the electronic entropy, we are thinking about the electroni, electronic states. So these are quantum states. And those quantum states are then occupied by the electrons. Well, turns out as you get near the Fermi level, some of those states become some of the uh, some of the states below the Fermi level become empty and some above become occupied. And that's because you have uh, electrons that are being promoted due to thermal considerations. So the question is, the question becomes, uh, how many different ways can those be configured? So this is the expression that we have, excuse me, for the electronic contribution to the entropy. And this term, or these two terms should look very similar to what you've seen for configurational entropy. This is the probability that a state is occupied times the log of the probability that is occupied plus the probability that a state is unoccupied times log of the probability that it is unoccupied. And those probabilities are given by what I'm calling here F, and that is our Fermi-Dirac distribution because these are uh, fermions, so they're quantum particles. And each one of these is at a different energy level. So we have to integrate over the entirety of the energy levels. Now, if you look at this, the zoom in here, there are states, but they're not equally spaced. And the spacing is going to tell us about the density of those states in our energy landscape. And that is expressed as electronic density of states. So this expression is the exact expression that you will want to use. Now, in, uh, well, in practice, we, we definitely know what the Fermi-Dirac distribution looks like. The density of states, well, that's a little more challenging. And you can measure the density of states through through various uh, spectroscopy techniques. You can compute it with the density functional theory type methods or, or other quantum calculations. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that we have a simple metal. And by that, I mean a well-behaved uh,
S valent metal. If you go to the metals that are in, say, the transition metals, you have D states, and things start getting a little bit wonky. But well behaved transition, uh, well behaved S valent metals, uh, well, they're they're well behaved, and they obey. They obey, well, relatively closely. Uh, they obey the free electron model. So that allows us to find an analytic expression for the density of states. And I'm not going to talk about this here. The The textbook that I like, uh, well, there's several, but the one that I, I used here was Solid State Physics. Second edition by R. J. Hook and H. E. Hall, and this was printed in 2000. So you can go and uh, work that out uh, from their textbook. Uh, so we've got the density of states. Now, we also need to know the Fermi energy, and that's because if you look at our, uh, let's say, energy, I'm going to draw our states in here, and these lower ones are occupied, I'll draw in a Fermi energy in here somewhere. As you get close to the Fermi energy, you start having, uh, excuse me, you start having the disorder due to partially occupied uh, states. So we need to know what the Fermi energy is. The uh, Fermi energy is also uh, needed for writing out the Fermi Dirac distribution. The Fermi Dirac distribution gives the occupancy, and I'm calling this F E, and it looks something like one zero it looks something like this. So it gives the probability of a, of a state being occupied, and it's zero above the Fermi energy, one below, and kind of in that local vicinity, you get a, a pretty good, uh, well, it's, it's approximately this, this S-shaped curve. So this Fermi energy also comes from the uh, also comes from the free electron model. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in these two, it is this n n and v that give us the electron density. Right? It's the number of electron per unit cell. And in, in our in our example, we're going to be looking at lithium. But nonetheless, uh, this is where the density density of is included, which is really the the fundamental contributing factor to the uh, free electron model. Okay. So for this example, for this example, I've decided to look at uh, lithium because it's a, a nice ideal metal that is well behaved. Uh, lithium is body center cubic, so it has 
two atoms in the unit cell, one valence atom, one valence electron per atom. And I just took the experimental cubic lattice parameter to be around 3.5 times 10 to the or angstrom. So here are our physical constants. Here's the density of states, Fermi energy. So, and I, I converted all of these into uh, SI units. Not necessarily the units that I'd want to work with if I was working derivations in solid state physics, but in terms of actually getting real numbers out, this is the way to go. This is the shape of our density of states. So it goes as, uh, and this is energy. So this goes as energy to the one half. This is our Fermi Dirac. Our Fermi Dirac distribution looks like this. This is E Fermi. And you can see that as I, as I increase the temperature, 100, 500, 1000, the curves smears out a little bit. So ultimately, the only place that we have an entropic contribution is going to be in here. That's where there's disorder. This is This is where the disorder comes from. Hey. So what are we going to integrate over? You know, minus infinity to plus infinity? In principle, sure, we could do that. Uh, in practice, no, we're not. <laughs> and we're not because out here, it doesn't really matter. Right, so what I've decided to do is to take this integral and instead of going from minus infinity to infinity, I'm gonna bracket it to within some distance. So I'm gonna give it some uh, x and I'm gonna say that we'll integrate from the min to the max and we're gonna say it's the Fermi level minus some x times the Boltzmann temperature times the temp Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the Fermi level plus that same. And in general, when we talk about the Boltzmann constant times temperature, that, that combination, that energy range gives you what we like to imagine is the range of energies where there's real action going on. Is it really true? Well, you'll, you'll see here in a little bit that it's not exactly true, but nonetheless, this is kind of a, a handy way to think. And it's the way a lot of people working in uh, you know, the physical sciences and, and uh, physics will think. So here I defined our uh, entropy and I used <clears throat> the integral from min to max of the energy. Uh, I did not integrate it. Did not integrate it analytically. I just took it numerically. So I'm just taking a numerical integral. Uh, taking an analytical integral that is something I'm quite interested in. I just don't have the time to do it right now. So. Uh, this is our solution. So here, uh, in this first plot, I decided to test. I decided to test uh, calculating the electronic entropy at three different temperatures: one hundred, five hundred, one thousand, varying the number or the uh, width of 
the integral range, right? So the question is, you know, how how wide can I make that? And it turns out when you get out here to, you know, five or six, it seems like it, it's fairly well converged. We could go to higher, computer time is cheap, but it, it, it's fairly well converged. And, you know, another question is, how does this change if you were to normalize it? You know, what is the effect of temperature? So if you take this and instead you look at the air as a fraction of the whole. So I'm comparing it out at 10 to X. Well, it turns out all three of those cur all three of those curves fall on top of each other. So the error does not seem to change at all with temperature. Okay, so I took and I plotted S elect versus temperature. And if we were to uh, just say, well, what is it in and around the, uh, you know, you know, this is nonsense because it, it melts, right? So what is the uh, what is the behavior around the melting temperature? Well, this is joule per Kelvin. And that's tiny. And that's because if you go back up and look at our derivation, we're really talking about a two-atom unit cell. So in order for us to get this into reasonable numbers, we have to turn it from joule per Kelvin per unit cell into joule per Kelvin per mole. And we do that with Avogadro's number, recognizing there's two atoms per unit cell. So that gives us that type of scaling, which means here we have around 0 0.3 joule per Kelvin mole. So this is how you compute the electronic contribution to the entropy. And, uh, you know, it's small compared to, for example, uh, configurational entropies and, and uh, like the entropy of formation, typically, maybe it's a one to two orders of magnitude smaller, but it's still non-trivial. Uh, and this was for an ideal ideal metal that can be uh, computed using the free electron model. But if you can compute your uh, density of states, then you can use this for any uh, for any metal you want. And something that I haven't done, which I'd like to, and then possibly will do so in, in the future, is I'm interested in getting a, a simplification. To get an analytical solution. And the way I'm planning to approach that is to uh, make a correction to the uh, Fermi Dirac, well, not a correction, let's call it a uh, simplification, right? Our Fermi Dirac distribution looks like this. <coughs> and at least from my perspective, that's one, that's zero, that's 0 0.5. This looks a lot like this, one, zero, and then a linear slope. So I, I think I think this is the approach to making us a simplification to get an analytical solution, but uh, I just haven't haven't had the time to to go through the math yet.